we are going to hear another super interesting talk by Kinge Guardian of GROW. Welcome, Kinge. Very nice to have you here or, or there. Um, where are you located at the moment? I'm in Sweden at the moment. Okay. Um, what do you see kind of the most interesting things when we're talking about this transition in, in, towards circular economy taking place in Sweden right now? There is a lot happening in Sweden. I think um, it's, it's very inspiring how also government policy has focused on their sustainability targets. It's a very material focused. Um, I'll also talk a bit later about that focus on materials, because um, I think we need to look a bit more beyond materials, but managing forests in the right way, um, recycling schemes. I think the pond, the recycling scheme was been one of the first ones that the world had uh, here in Sweden. So there is a lot happening and there is a lot of support from the government happening. Uh, and I think that's really crucial. Fantastic to hear. Kinge, please. All right, I'll take it over. Well, thanks for having me today. Um, it's really excited to have a full talk about circular design and that we're now at this stage that we have so many different perspectives on design. So my name is Kinge. Um, it's a little odd. I'm talking to a screen right now. So I'm not able to see people that are tuning in, but I hope you can all follow this well. And um, you can ask any questions. Uh, I heard there is a chat, so, so please do if you have any questions. Um, I will talk about how we approach circular design at GROW. And I'll illustrate that with a story of Yangi, uh, one of our packaging designs that has been created on circular principles. So first, a little bit about who we are. Um, I'll press on the next slide. <laughs> Um, we are a design agency based in Stockholm. There you go. Uh, on this photo, you can see our office. It's right in the middle next to the church. Uh, we're there uh, with 50 people and mainly working on packaging design, innovation and brand development. Um, but since 2018, we've also broadened our scope. So we, since 2018, we're part of Digitalist Group. Uh, with studios all across the globe. I'm just trying to flick through the slides. It's a bit difficult in this system. Let's see if I don't think it's, I'll just, yeah, thank you. Um, so since 2018, we're part of Digitalist Group. And that means that we have a bit more broad scope of, of where we work. And amongst other studios, it's also in Helsinki. Um, and being part of a more global network allowed us to enhance different capabilities depending per studio. And one of them is, for example, technical capabilities, uh, thinking about software, AI, which is also a very crucial component of moving towards more circular designs. And just a, a very brief view, uh, you can see our team, uh, just a picture of our team so you have an idea. Um, who we are, it's a set of people with a lot of different design backgrounds. Um, it's still not where I'm, I'm pressing on the, just for the people, the global queue live. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is a team, very different design backgrounds in there. It's about insights, innovation, product, service, a lot of different design people. And then we also have a little overview of the companies that we work with, just to give you an idea of who we are and, and who we work with before I start the story on what we do. Um, yeah, thank you. And then the next one, please. Yes. All right. Because specifically today, I want to focus on our future labs and future packaging initiative. This is one of our focus areas at GROW, and we take a slightly different and collaborative approach to innovation, and therefore it is also a different um, operational unit. We call it our innovation platform. 
So at Fu within Future Labs, we collaborate with the entire value chains, scientists, inventors, industrials, and brands in order to make real change into sustainable and circular systems. And as mentioned, we work collaboratively as partners. So that also means that we have a shared risk, a shared award between all these value chain stakeholders. Um, and that's all about investing in a future that we all want to live in. And we realize then that with value and innovation. And, and this initiative hasn't been invented in one day. Uh, designers at Grow have been working since quite some time uh, to create sustainable circular solutions. However, what was often a bottleneck in projects has been the disconnectedness and complexity of the value chain, uh, especially when working on fuzzy front end of innovation and, and circular systems, where there are just a lot of unknowns. Uh, working in a traditional method didn't really give us the solutions that we wanted to see. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, to make it more practical, you can see a closer look of our partner ecosystem. And you can also see some of the imagery of our cases. And I'll, I'll run through some of the building blocks in the way we work. So for every project you see, we're working together with, a, with different partners. Uh, the projects were created with a vision. And you can see here the SDGs uh, in the middle, which are very important together with circular economy, of course. But when we set a vision for a certain project, it's, of course, more specific than only that SDG. And I'll give an example um, a bit later. So all these cases are built on new materials and new technologies. So they're really working with innovative materials and, and things on the forefront of what we can do. And to guide those innovation processes, we use a lot of design methodologies. So for example, a lot of prototyping, rapid prototyping, visual storytelling, and so on. Um, so one of the, in the right lower corner, you can see one of our earlier uh, innovation platform projects. And that really led up to the start of the future packaging lab. And that's the paper bottle, uh, Paboco is the, is the name of the company now. Um, and where often people move from theory to practice, this has really worked the other way around. So it, it was from practice into theory. And on the next slide, um, you can see it a bit bigger. So the paper, bottle, the paper bottle project started in 2015. And here talking about the more specific vision, the vision here was to create a bottle that's first of all 100% renewable and also 100% recyclable. Um, you might think why renewable and then recyclable? Uh, that has to do with our notion of recycling, because indeed we need to make sure that all of our products get either composted or recycled. However, recycling is not really our holy grail. And if we want to keep using fossil fuel materials, even though they're 100% recyclable, recycled, and after that used again, which is far from what's happening uh, today, we would not restore the planet still. And we will be, um, and we have seen it today before, on the last bad skill, even though we're really trying to be better. Um, so to design effective systems, we not only need to look at the recyclability, but also how regenerative our materials are. Um, and that will lead us to, do, to the doing good, doing more good skill, being restorative and regenerative. So you can see an overview of the brands that we work together with in this, uh, this picture and the technology partners. Uh, the brands were Carlsberg, L'Oreal, uh, Coca-Cola and Absolute. And you can see the, um, the specific design of the Absolute bottle on the next slide. Um, it has been made with a big focus on the natural elements and the traits of the material. Um, as well as having a crafty view on the creation of the product itself. So the bottle is made from sustainably sourced wood fibers from Scandinavia. Um, it's made with a wet forming cellulose process where the input is uh, the raw material that you use is pulp uh, and not paper. So not the paper that we know it, but the step before that. Uh, because when you make paper, you already use a lot of energy. And if you go directly from using the pulp, you skip a step, which basically saves a lot of energy and, and water and emissions with that. 
Um, you can see the bubble is not yet made of 100% paper. Uh, so it doesn't live up to its full vision yet. Um, and that's because this is only the first version of the bottle, um, which we need to make process towards a fully paper bottle. We need buy-in uh, from brands in this bottle. We need to show to people that it is possible. It just takes steps to get there. And I can tell you there is a, a fully paper bottle version now, uh, a prototype, uh, and that's after seven years. So the, we're going towards the right vision. Um, and then on the next slide, I'll continue with the next case. And that's the one that I promised to talk about. Uh, it's Yangi. And this is one of our most recently launched products. It's a it's cellulose packed refill pack for the cosmetics industry. Um, it's You can fill it with facial cream, for example. And this is also made from pulp. Uh, and the technology behind this one is dry forming, which sounds a lot like wet forming. Uh, and the process is a little bit similar, but as the name suggests, it's uh, a dry and more lean process, which means it uses even less water uh, and also less energy in the production, which of course is then positive for the footprint. In this photo, you can see the four steps of the product. So really going from a pulp sheet towards the formed container. And on the next slide, uh, you can see a photo of the full Yangi packaging system. So in order to get as much value out of Yangi as possible, building on circular principles, as you can see on the page as well, we have created a refill system where the Yangi refill container is fit within a durable jar. And the jar is also cellulose based um, from another technology. It's actually one from Finland. Um, and putting all these elements together means that you have a refill system entirely made out of renewable material. So I think we all know how the refill concept works. Uh, when someone has finished their facial cream, a new refill can be bought. And the only waste is the, the paper pulp based container, which then needs to be recycled in paper recycling. Um, and this, this will be a, a really big savior in the amount of material that we use for each pack. Um, so I'm reflecting back on the collaborative way of working, um, even though this is the focus, Yangi, uh, we still need a lot of different elements in the value chain as well to get towards a final product. Uh, so for example, the jar, but also barriers that can hold the, the facial cream in the container, uh, also technology, and I'll talk a little bit later about that as well. And there are also brands involved, of course, but I cannot mention their names, unfortunately. Um, so going to the next slide, I want to take a little pause for reflection about this product. Um, what I've been talking about is circular product design. And I think it's a great example of what is happening in material innovation and using renewable materials, as well as applying it for the best possible solution with it. Because we need, when we have a new material, we need to make sure that we create something out of it that maximizes the value of the material. So it has focused at designing out any toxics, um, less waste as possible. Functionalities that can be made durable are durable. So this, that's the jar then. And the one that can be, need to be cycled are made with minimum materials. And that's the, uh, the principles that we often refer to as circular design. Um, but if we have a little think more about the production rates, the consumption rates, uh, the amount that we consume as well as produce is very high, much higher than the earth can offer us at the moment. And there are really great calculations like the earth overshoot day, where they calculate how much uh, 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 the earth can offer us and when in a year we've taken that. When, what the earth can offer us. And I've had a little look for Finland. The day is on April 10th, which is the first half of the year already, which I think is quite shockingly early. And after that date, we only live on borrowed resources. And next to that, we should also take into account that the world population is still growing as well as the spending power. And we have achieved a sort of level of conform uh, comfort that I think we'll not be able to 
go back from a lot. Um, and that also will all together will result in a lot more product and material use. Recycling rates are improving, but as mentioned before, they're not nearly close to what the production and consumption rates are at the moment. And there is actually a graph on that. I thought about sharing that with you today, but I'll spare you a graph uh, and just tell the story about it. But it's a forecast on the recycling rates versus the production rates looking forward for 20 years. And what we see is that even though recycling is greatly improving, if we don't produce less, produce better, we will still be far over um, using the resources what the earth can offer us. So I think the design challenge here is that we need to look beyond the materialistic view of circular design. Um, within the material domain, of course, we need to stay within using materials and products that can re-enter the system after their first life, staying within the boundaries of that graph. Um, but realistically, we're, all we're not all rational humans. So it will be a really tough challenge to only design circular uh, without changing any behavior. So I think the question here is, how can we reach our circular goals without people to lose that level of comfort? And we need to do that by dematerializing value uh, and push for a bigger focus on what I'd like to call the intangible side of circular design, which is in the experience domain and the systems domain. And I'll take you through some of the ways we touched upon that with Yangi now. Um, designing the system and front end and back end services. So on the next slide, I'm going back to the Yangi story um, where we put Yangi in a broader context. And here you see the traditional way of production, consumption and disposal. Uh, so what if we were to replace the traditional packaging with a cellulose based one, even though paper recycling rates are over 70%. So they're a lot better than the plastic recycling rates but it will not give us a circular system. Um, and if on the next slide you see uh, is of course a very simplified version, but this focus on the material flow and the refill aspect of the system. So to redesign the system, we ne need to not only align the whole value chain, but also the people's behaviors. And visualizing what a circular system could look like really enabled us to get a grasp of what change we needed to, to make uh, where to intervene. Uh, it helped us create curiosity from different angles, so from stakeholders in the value chain to, to talking with consumers uh, and as well uh, an educational part. So, and, and one example of that is understanding the relationship between the user and the product. Traditionally, wise packaging is a very, uh, very functional in the sense of the word, uh, however, when we shift away from single-use packaging to more durable goods, we can also change the relationship that one has with the packaging. I, I get messages on, on this side that I only have two minutes left. So I think um, I'm, I'm going to go to a little bit of a, of a freestyling mode here from what I plan to. But if we go to the next stage, uh, what I want to, the next uh, slide, what I wanted to show was some of the uh, ways that we made the, the packaging more experience-based. So more about the experience of using the product and less about the, the, the materialistic side of the product. Um, so one of them is by having an application, how you can reorder it. Uh, and one of the very uh, important functions, I think, is advising on the right product. Because a factor of a lot of throwaways of facial creams at the moment is that the product hasn't been fitted to the person. So it was not used because of that. And on the next slide, we, uh, we show a little bit more on the flow. Um, <laughs> and then uh, to summarize on the next slide, sorry, I get, I get chased. It makes me nervous a little bit. But um, we work with the innovation model level. So looking at materials, products, service, and systems. And all those model levels are intertwined. So making a decision on one level of the product will have an effect on the different level of the product. 
uh, from one side to the other side. But understanding the context of materials and products in their respective system is really paramount in creating successful and sustainable systems. So I wanted to end up this, uh, this talk with a visual in the next slide that's cre been created by my colleague Axel, because I think it shows uh, very well how we've created products uh, without really thinking about what the proper system is with that, within it. And uh, in the middle, as it says in Swedish, it's so easy to drink water nowadays. Um, and then it shows the whole system that's behind it, which in a, in a way wouldn't have to be necessary. Um, so sorry for the rush through in the end, um, but I hope that you will use the example of Yangi and this story to um, get inspired and take a different uh, perspective to your circular design, because I think we really need to now move beyond designing circular materials and products and start designing for the experience domain around circular products and how we can make great experience, but with really minimizing the product and the material use. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, and feel free to reach out because I've brushed through some bits. Thank you so much, Kinge. You're doing such fantastic work. A couple of questions to you. Um, you were talking about regenerative materials and sort of staying in a tidal loop rather than going into recycling. That That's not really the kind of solution. Um, how big part of your work is educating your clients, like having that dialogue that what does regenerative actually mean? Because I think that we're all familiar with recycling. Yeah, I think um, it's it's a really big part, and um, I've seen it over the over the years how education has shifted. So in the beginning, we were saying this is the circular economy, uh, and then we we had to say this is why you need to use design. Um, but thinking about the regenerative versus recyclability, it's um, we. We, what we come across a lot is that people want to replace their plastic packaging for paper packaging one-to-one. -one. Uh, but it's really often that the functionalities of plastic are different than from paper. So replacing it one-to-one -one is not the most effective use of paper. Mm. Um, you can do a lot of different things with it. And, and that's where we need design for, uh, to create the right solutions for the products. And... Um, Recyclability, we need to work towards recyclability. So I'm not saying that it's not important. It really is important. But we need to understand that there comes a step before that. And that has to do with how a system functions. And when it's a regenerative material, meaning that it's from a natural source and, and it can grow again, um, we, we, it's, it's better in line with how the earth offers us with resources. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Kinga. Yeah.